erupted, the Union and Confederacy faced the challenge of organizing armies composed of huge numbers of volunteers with little or no military experience. Crucial to this task was finding generals able to lead these massive armies. To address the challenge, Union and Confederate leaders relied on state government governors to raise hundreds of regiments commanded largely by community leaders, while higher commands fell to professional soldiers nominated by Presidents Abraham Lincoln and Jefferson Davis and ratified by their Senates. Indiana answered this call with approximately 120 generals. As you will see, few distinguished themselves at highest command, but they were a unique group nevertheless, and as a group they contributed significantly uh, to the Union victory in the Civil War. My new book, uh, <clears throat> Indiana Generals of the Civil War, culminates research that began in 1961 when I was a freshman in, at Silver Creek High School in Sellersburg. My high, high school years coincided with the Civil War centennial, which continued into my freshman year at Anderson College, now Anderson University. I already had a deep interest in American uh, history, and when the centennial began, I, or commenced, I began studying the conflict with fascination. I haunted local libraries and bookstores and began building my professional library. I was especially engrossed, like many were at that time, with the military side of the conflict, and over time it converged with my interest in Indiana history, which started with my eighth grade Indiana history course. As my research proceeded, I focused increasingly on Indiana generals. That curiosity reflected a realization that the meaning of general was uh, very widely. <laughs> there were full generals, there were brevet generals, there were state generals, there were regular army generals, and generals of volunteers. There were even generals who never held that rank, but who were addressed as such by their communities. And of course, that title carried over into some of the literature. To make sense of the situation, I began preparing sketches for, for, of individual generals, all the while attempting to determine their official status. I consulted county histories, multi-volume Indiana histories, reference books, biographies, and other scholarly and popular sources. I eventually uh, was aided by Ezra J. Warner's book, Generals in Blue, Lives of the Union Commanders, which my parents gave me for my birthday in 1965. Throughout my research, I made notes on three by five cards and replaced them in a little green file box. After graduating from Anderson in 1968, I moved on to graduate school and ultimately earned a doctorate in American history from the University of Toledo in 1980. During the following decades, I operated a consulting firm and taught at the University of Louisville at Indiana University Southeast, including a Civil War and Reconstruction course at IUS. Meanwhile, that little box sat on a bookshelf near my desk, a constant reminder of an unfinished task. Finally, in, in 2020, as COVID-19 and other forces slowed my consulting activity, I took up its challenge. The result is a total of 121 sketches, including 44 full Union generals, one Confederate general, 62 brevet generals, and 14 state service generals. So, who were these generals, and what defined their status? Under federal policy, full-ranked generals were nominated by the President and ratified by the Senate in accordance with their respective constitutional powers. Brevet gen appointments, including generalships, were essentially honorary uh, promotions upon nomination of the President for gallantry or other noteworthy uh, service. Many brevet generals uh, or brevets to full rank occurred after the war 
retroactive to a late wartime date. Andrew Johnson made a slew of uh, uh, brevets. State generals were commissioned by governors to militia commands or administrative positions such as quartermaster, commissary, and adjutant generals. Selection criteria for this volume favored inclusion. The ultimate authority for eligibility of, of full rank generals is Warner's Generals in Blue. The basis for eligibility of brevet generals is a roster of officers of that rank included in an appendix to Warner's book. The authority for state appointed generals is uh, Indiana in the War of the Rebellion the summary volume of Indiana Adjutant General William H. H. Carroll's 1869 final report, reissued in 1960 by the Indiana Historical Bureau. In determining an individual's Indiana connection, I considered three primary criteria. First, anyone born in Indiana is included, irrespective of life tenure in the state. Some lived in the state a very short time before relocating. A good example is Marcellus Monroe Crocker. He was born in Franklin, Indiana, attended West Point, but left early to study law. Upon admission to the bar, he opened practice in Des Moines, Iowa. When the Civil War began, he volunteered for service and exercised several stellar brigade and division commands before contracting tuberculosis from which he died in August 1865. Second criteria, officers born elsewhere but who spent a great, a significant part of their lives in Indiana are included. This criterion includes some who lived in the state before the war and then relocated. Lovell Harrison Rousseau, for example, was born in Kentucky, moved to Indiana, practiced law, and served in the Indiana General Assembly before returning to Louisville, where he practiced law and served in the Kentucky Senate. When the war erupted, he helped organize local defense. The city council appointed him Brigadier General of the Home Guard, making him the only Union general appointed by a city. When Kentucky declared for the Union, Rousseau entered federal service as a colonel and soon was promoted to Brigadier General of the Volunteers. He exercised several divisional commands in the Western Theater and, <coughs> pardon me, and was elected to Congress shortly after the war ended. Third, several persons who arrived in Indiana early in the war played an important role in organizing the state's military operations and maintained a significant presence after the war are included. For example, Brevet Brigadier General James Adams Eakin, a Pennsylvania steamboat builder, joined the Quartermaster Corps, arrived in uh, Indiana early in the war, and helped Governor Oliver P. Martin organize quartermaster operations. He remained in Indiana after the war and served as the first commander of the Western Arsenal uh, in Jeffersonville, and the Western Arsenal is what we commonly refer to as the Quadrangle. Uh, so that was the core of the Quartermaster Depot that experienced major expansion during World War I. He is also uh, the namesake for Eakin Avenue in uh, New Albany, but he was buried in Louisville, Cave Hill. A somewhat similar case was uh, James Merle Shackelford, a Kentucky Navy, Shackelford practiced law in Louisville. When the war began, he recruited soldiers for the Union Army, commanded the 8th Kentucky Cavalry, and joined the pursuit of John Hunt Morgan's 1863 raid through Kentucky, Indiana, and Ohio. <clears throat> he resigned in January 1864, after the death of his wife, and settled in Evansville, where he reopened his law practice. He remained in his adopted state until 1889 when he was appointed U.S. Judge for the Indian Territory, now Oklahoma. Upon his death, his body was returned to Louisville. <clears throat> there are also a few unique entries. Perhaps most notable, General John Milton Brannan was born and reared in uh, Washington, D.C. 
where he was a messenger in the U.S. House of Representatives. However, he was appointed to West Point from Indiana <laughs> through, through the actions of Hoosier Congressman Ratliff Boone and became a professional soldier. He remained in the Army in the, throughout his adult life, including divisional command at Chickamauga and service as uh, chief of artillery during the defense of Chattanooga and Sherman's Atlanta campaign. Collectively, Hoosier generals reflected a variety of characteristics that mirrored the state of, of American society. The Civil War was a young man's war, and the same was true for its generals. Of the 44 full rank generals, five were under 30 when the war began, and 22 were in their 30s. 15 were between 41 and 50, and just two were over 50. Brevet generals were even more youthful. As many moved rapidly through the ranks, uh, as officers ahead of them were killed or disabled. <laughs> me. 28 of the 62 brevet generals were in their 20s, and 27 were in their 30s when the war began. A mere five were in their 40s, and only one was past 50. Generals in state service were slightly older, uh, with just two in their 20s and four in their 30s when the war began. <coughs> While eight were in their 40s and 50s. This trend undoubtedly uh, reflected Governor Morton's preference for experienced men in major administrative roles. Indiana's youngest full jet rank general when the war began was Robert Francis Catterson who was born in 1835 in Beach Grove, just outside of Indianapolis. He attended college in Michigan and studied medicine at Cincinnati Medical College. He had recently opened a practice in Rockville when the war erupted. At age 26, he joined the 14th Indiana Infantry and advanced quickly to Colonel with command of the 97th Indiana Infantry. He participated in several major engagements including the Siege of Vicksburg, the Battles of Tullahoma and Chattanooga, and Sherman's Atlanta, camp Atlanta March of the Sea, and, and Carolina campaigns. Just 30 years old when the war ended, he was promoted to Brigadier General of Volunteers to rank from May 31st, 1865. Catterson was also Indiana's last surviving full rank general, dying on March 30th, 1914 at age 84. The youngest Brevet General was William Wade Dudley, who was born in Vermont uh, on August 27, 1842, making him just 18 years old when the war began. After studying at Phillips Academy in Danville, Vermont, uh, and Russell Military Academy in uh, uh, New Haven, Connecticut, he moved to Richmond, Indiana. When the war began, he was elected captain of the Richmond City Grades. The company was mustered into the uh, 19th Indiana Infantry, which became part of the famed Iron Brigade. He, rem he made it unscathed through 2nd Bull Run, Antietam, Fredericksburg, and Chancellorsville, and rose to lieutenant colonel. But a wound at uh, Gettysburg required amputation of his right leg and reassignment to the Veterans Reserve Corps, which supplied disabled officers for non-combatant uh, assignments. He was promoted to Brevet Brigadier General in March 1885 uh, for his gallantry. Uh, some of you, particularly John or uh, Tom, may remember the post-war political years, the infamous Dudley letters. This is the William W. Dudley who uh, was behind the uh, Dudley letters. Orion Bartholo Alexander Bartholomew was the last surviving Brevet General. He was born September 4, 1837 near Danville. His noteworthy wartime service was command of two U.S. colored regiments. After commanding the 15th Colored Regiment in Tennessee, he organized the 101st U.S. Colored Troops in 1814, or pardon me, 1864, 
and led them at the siege of Petersburg and R Richmond. After the war, he practiced law in Iowa and Minneapolis, where he died in 1919 at age 85. He was buried at Lakewood Cemetery, where many uh, Minnesota notables, including former uh, Vice President Hubert H. Humphrey, uh, are interred. The eldest of all generals was Brevet Brigadier General uh, John Smith Simonson. He was born June 2nd, 1796, in Uniontown, Pennsylvania. His family later moved to Indiana, from where he served in the War of 1812. He settled in Charlestown after the war and served in several elected positions. He resumed military service in, in the Black Hawk War and then was elected to the State House of Representatives. He was the House Speaker when the Mexican-American War erupted, but he answered President James K. Polk's call to raise a company of mounted riflemen and serve as its captain. He remained in the Army and retired as Colonel just before the war began. Though he was too old for combat, Governor Oliver P. Morton appointed him to several administrative posts and in 1863, the War Department designated him commander of the District of Indiana. He was breveted Brigadier General in March 1865 and remained in service, settling claims of deceased soldiers until 1867. He died in 1881 at the age of 85. While Governor Martin tended to favor mature men to head major commands, he did not hesitate to call upon talented younger men. Such was the case in May 1862 when he tapped 30-year-old John Chalfant New, a former Marion County clerk and state senator, to succeed John H. Badgen as state quartermaster general. For the next six months, New worked closely with James A. Eakin to supply uniforms and equipment to troops organized in the state and to construct barracks to house troops being organized into regiments. The eldest and one of, uh, and one of two of Indiana's foreign born state officials was John Lutz Mansfield. Born as Johann B. Lutz in Germany in 1803, Mansfield studied, studied at Gernicken and Heidelberg before emigrating to the U.S. in, 19, in 1824. He studied in Lexington, Kentucky, and taught mathematics and civil engineering at Transylvania University until 1858, when he re relocated to Jefferson County, Indiana. He was soon elected to the State House of Representatives and served one term. In September 1861, Governor Morton appointed him Brigadier General of the Indiana Legion with responsibility to defend the Ohio River border and to guard Camp Morton in Indianapolis. He was promoted to Major General in 1864 and served until November 1865. The other foreign-born state officer was John H. Badgen, a native of Hanover, Germany, who used his experience in the hardware business to bring a high degree of order into procuring, storing, and distributing military equipment and other goods to military forces being organized in the state. Mirroring national migration patterns, Indiana Civil War generals were a mobile lot. 21 full and 24 Brevet generals were born in the state, and several moved elsewhere during their lives. But the state attracted even more future generals from other states and some from other nations. Eight full rank generals were born in Kentucky, and four others came from Maryland, District of Columbia, Alabama, and North Carolina, perhaps reflecting the movement of anti-slavery Southern whites to free states. Ohio sent five, an equivalent number came from New York, Massachusetts, and Pennsylvania, and one hailed from Prussia. Exemplifying high mobility and anti-slavery sentiment was General John Edwards. He was born in Louisville, as a young adult, he studied law and was elected uh, to, the Indian, the, to the Kentucky Senate. Although his father was a slaveholder, Edwards Bay hated slavery and moved to Lawrenceburg, Indiana. When his father died, he freed the slaves. 
1844, Edwards was elected to the Indiana House of Representatives and served one term before moving to California in 1849. He stayed there just three years and returned to Indiana and was promptly elected to the state senate. Edwards served briefly before moving to Iowa, uh, <clears throat> where he became involved in politics and was elected Speaker of the Iowa House of Representatives. During the war, he served as an advisor, military aide to Governor Samuel Kirkwood and held successive regimental uh, brigade and division commands. He was promoted to Brigadier General of Volunteers in, 18, in September 1864. After the war, he received a federal appointment as in, in Arkansas and served briefly in the U.S. House of Representatives. I think that adds up to about seven different states wow. uh, where Edward li Edwards lived. <laughs> and he wasn't the only one. An exemplar of mobility, uh, mobility Southern uh, anti-slavery sentiment and family division was Thomas Tur Turpin Crittenden, born in Alabama, he was the nephew of Kentucky Senator John J. Crittenden and first cousin of Union General Thomas L. Crittenden and Confederate General George B. Crittenden. Crittenden's parents soon moved to Texas, where he lived until beginning uh, law studies at Transylvania University. After graduating, he entered practice in Hannibal, Missouri. He served as a lieutenant in the Mexican-American War and then opened the law office in Madison, Indiana. He joined the Union Army when the Civil War began and led a regiment at Shiloh. He was promoted to Brigadier General of Volunteers in April 1862 and fought in Murfreesboro, Tennessee. But his service ended abruptly after his force was surprised by General Nathan B. Forrest's cavalry. His commander, General Don Carlos Buell, criticized him for neglect of duty, prompting his resignation in May 1863. Indiana's lone foreign-born full-rank general was August von Willich. A native of Prussia, Willich was educated in military schools and entered the Prussian army in 1828. During the revolutionary movement that swept Europe between 1846 and 1848, he fell under the influence of Karl Marx and other radicals. When the revolution failed, he emigrated to the United States, settled in Cincinnati, and edited a German language newspaper. When the Civil War erupted, he recruited a German regiment and led it in George McClellan's Western Virginia campaign. In late 1861, Governor Morton invited him to command the German-American 32nd Indiana Regiment. In 1862, Willie led it at uh, Shiloh, and over the next three years, he held brigade and divisional commands at Murfreesboro, Chickamauga, and the Atlantic, Atlantic Campaign. By the mid-19th century, domestic uh, emigration to Indiana was shifting from southern to central and northern parts of the state. The nativity of Brevet, Brigadier, Brevet generals, probably because they were younger than their full rank counterparts, reflected this pattern. The slave states of Kentucky, Tennessee, Virginia, Maryland, and North Carolina birthed one each, while Ohio contributed 13, and 15 arrived from New York, Pennsylvania, and New England. Reflecting the influx of immigrants, three brevet generals came from Germany, one from Canada, and another from Hungary. The state service generals hailed from the same states as the full rank of brevet generals, but the distribution was more balanced. Three each came from Indiana and Kentucky, two each were born in Ohio and Virginia, and one each migrated from Maryland and Pennsylvania, and two were born in Germany. Since the war was fought by huge volunteer armies, both governments recruited officers from all walks of life, and without <coughs> and most without prior military, military training or experience. Thus, the officer corps at all three levels was occupationally diverse. Professional soldiers were prized, especially graduates of West Point and other military academies, such as Norwich uh, University and Northfield, Vermont. 
At least a dozen full generals were professional soldiers, including nine West Pointers and one Naval Academy graduate. Several figures exemplify this theme. Uh, Edward R. S. Canby uh, was born in Boone County, Kentucky in 1817. His family moved to Crawfordsville, Indiana, where he attended Wabash College before entering West Point, where he graduated in 1839. He served in the Mexican War, uh, multiple Indian campaigns, and the Mormon War of 1857-58. When the Civil War, Civil War erupted, he was promoted to colonel and given command of the 19th U.S. Infantry and the Department of New, Me New Mexico. Subsequent assignments included suppression of the New York City draft riots and support of Admiral David G. Farragut's capture of Mobile. After the war, he served five years on Reconstruction. In 1873, he commanded the Division of the Pacific in California, during which he was murdered by Captain Jack, leader of the Modoc Indians, while negotiating their removal from the Siskiyou County lava beds. Another Kentuckian was Joseph Jones Reynolds. His family moved to Lafayette, Indiana when he was 15. After graduating from West Point, he served in the Mexican-American War and then taught for eight years at the academy before becoming an engineer, uh, an engineering professor at Washington University in St. Louis. He also operated a grocery business with his brother in Lafayette. When the Civil War began, Reynolds served briefly with the Indiana Legion before being commissioned Brigadier General of Volunteers. When his brother died, he resigned and took over the grocery business. But he also organized state units. And in August 1862, he returned to service as Colonel of the 75th Indiana Infantry. He was soon recommissioned to Brigadier General and given command of a division in the Indiana or in the Army of the Cumberland. Uh, with which he fought at Tullahoma, Chickamauga, New Orleans, and Mobile. A native New Yorker, Milo Smith Haskell, moved to Goshen, Indiana in his teens and secured an appointment uh, to West Point in the class of 1852. He was assigned to artillery duty at several posts, but grew dissatisfied with garrison duty and resigned his commission. He returned to Goshen, studied law, and opened a legal practice. He also served as Elkhart County District Attorney and County Court Clerk. When the Civil War broke out, Haskell was appointed Colonel of the 17th Indiana Infantry and led it at the Battle of Philippi in Western Virginia. After leading a brigade at Shiloh, he was promoted to Brigadier uh, General, led a brigade at Murfreesboro and Stones River, and briefly commanded the Division of Indiana, rounding up deserters and curbing copperheads and Democratic newspapers. He later helped defend Knoxville and commanded the Division in Sherman's Atlanta campaign. After the war, he resumed law practice, became a banker, and later entered the real estate business in Chicago. So he moved around considerably as well. Particularly unique uh, was Thomas Gamble Pitcher. He's one of our favorites. A Hoosier native, he entered West Point and graduated 40th out of 40, 41 <laughs> in the class of 1845. He participated in the, the occupation of Texas and was decorated for gallantry in the Mexican-American War. When the Civil War broke out, he was a captain and commissary officer at Fort Bliss in El Paso, Texas. He was transferred back east and given command of a battalion in General Nathaniel P. Banks' Corps. At Cedar Mountain in August 1862, Pitcher received a wound that rendered him unfit for combat. <clears throat> Nevertheless, he advanced to Brigadier General in November 1862 and served through the end of the war as Provo Marshal in Vermont and Indiana. What makes him unique is that in August 1866, he was appointed superintendent of West Point, making him the lowest ranking alumnus <laughs> ever to get to uh, the academy. A few Union generals began their uh, careers uh, in the Navy. 
One was Jeremiah Cutler Sullivan, a native of Madison. Sullivan graduated from Indian from Annapolis in 1848 uh, and served on four vessels before resigning his commission and studying law. Upon entering the bar, he opened practice in Indianapolis. When the Civil War began, he helped organize the 6th Indiana Infantry, a three-month unit, was commissioned a captain, and fought in Western Virginia. Sullivan was then appointed Colonel of the 13th Indiana and led at Rich Mountain. He was commissioned Brigadier General in 1862, fought at Iuka and Corinth, and given command in the district of Jackson, Tennessee. He displayed his moral fiber when he refused to execute General U.S. Grant's order to expel Jews uh, from the district. He ultimately was forced to carry out Grant's order, but President Lincoln uh, quickly revoked it. And apparently he lost no respect uh, from uh, Grant for standing up uh, to Grant. Several non-academy graduates were regular army officers, and many had served in the Mexican-American War. However, there weren't enough professional soldiers to command the many regiments recruited for service. So governors relied on community leaders to fill the gap. Because of their high public profiles and political connections, lawyers recruited many regiments and were commissioned colonels to lead them. Many became generals as their superiors took new commands or were killed or disabled in action. Examples of prominent lawyer generals abound. Terre Haute native Charles Cruft was admitted to the bar in 1848 and engaged in the railroad business. When the Civil War began, he was commissioned colonel of the 31st Indiana Infantry and assigned to a brigade in General Lew Wallace's division. He was wounded at Shiloh and, prov and promoted to Brigadier General of Volunteers. He was wounded again at Richmond, Kentucky, and subsequently commanded a brigade at Corinth, Mississippi in October 1862. During the balance of the war, he commanded a brigade at Stones River and Murfreesboro and led divisions at Chickamauga and Nashville. After the war, Cruft resumed law practice in Terre Haute. Walter Quinton Gresham was born in Lanesville, Indiana, over in Harrison County, in 1832. He studied law at Indiana University, was admitted to the bar in 1854, and commenced practice in Corridor. After unsuccessful runs for Harrison County prosecutor and clerk, he was elected state representative as a Republican in 1860. He quickly uh, became a leader in the Senate, but he butted heads with the governor, who refused to give him a regimental command when the war began. Persisting, Graham enlist, Gresham enlisted as a private and rose quickly to company captain. <clears throat> he finally was commissioned colonel of the 53rd Indiana Infantry. Promoted to Brigadier General in August 1863, he held brigade and divisional commands in Vicksburg, Natchez, and Atlanta, where a sharpshooter's bullet shattered his knee and ended his military career. He resumed practice in New Albany and became prominent in national politics, serving as U.S. District Judge for Indiana, Postmaster General, Secretary of the Treasury, Circuit Court of Appeals Judge, and Secretary of State. His position at the time of his death in, 18, in May 1895. John Franklin Miller was born in South Bend and studied law at Boston Spa Law School in Saratoga, New York. After passing the bar, he commenced practice in his hometown and was elected uh, to the state senate in 1861. When the Civil War, Civil War erupted, he was commissioned colonel of the 29th Indiana Infantry. He served a succession of increasingly responsible commands, fighting at Shiloh, Corinth, Stones River, and Tullahoma, where he lost his left eye at Liberty Gap. He was promoted to Brigadier General of Volunteers in April 1864, and was assigned as garrison commander at Nashville, where he led a large force of infantry and artillery defending the city in December 1864. After the war, President Andrew Jackson, 
Johnson appointed him collector of customs at San Francisco. In 1880, he was elected to the U.S. Senate, where he staunchly supported this Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882. Other full generals had a variety of professional and vocational backgrounds. Several were journalists. Robert Alexander Cameron, a New York native, moved with his parents to Valparaiso in 1843. He studied medicine in Laporte, but abandoned the field in 1857 and bought the Valparaiso Republican, which he edited at the time of the Civil War commenced. George Henry Chapman was born in Massachusetts and moved with his family to Terre Haute when he was a child. The family subsequently moved to Indianapolis, where Chapman's father and uncle organized the Indiana State Sentinel. Chapman followed his elders into journalism, editing and publishing Chapman's Chanticleer from 1853 to 1854 and the Indiana Republic from, Republican from 1854 to 1855. Meanwhile, he studied law and was admitted to the bar in 1857 and served clerkships in the Indiana and U.S. Houses of Representatives. Among other occupations, Nathan Kimball, a native of Washington County, Indiana, studied medicine and entered a practice in Independence, Missouri. After service as a captain in the Mexican-American War, he returned to Indiana and was practicing in Lagoonie uh, when the Civil War erupted. Thomas John Lucas, a native of Lawrenceburg, followed his father's trade of, uh, as a watchmaker, except for time out as a lieutenant during the Mexican-American War. George Francis McGinnis, a native of Maine, moved to Chillicothe, Ohio, with his father, who plied the hatter's trade. After serving as an officer in the Mexican-American War, McGinnis moved to Indianapolis and began manufacturing hats, pursuing the business until the Civil War erupted. Solomon Meredith, a North Carolina Quaker whose parents were Underground Railroad conductors moved to Wayne County, Indiana, where he was active in farming, railroad promotion, and politics. Especially noteworthy, Indiana-born and Missouri-reared uh, uh, William Anderson Pye, Pyle, a Methodist minister, was the only man of the cloth to serve as a full rank general. He started as a chaplain, but quickly moved to becoming a, uh, a combat uh, general. Brevet generals were even more occupationally diverse. Because of their relative youth, the occupations of 15 brevet generals are unknown. Among those whose occupations are known, more than a third were lawyers, and only four were professional soldiers, including two West Point graduates. Others included engineers, millers, merchants, and numerous business owners, professionals, and tradesmen. Lawyers also dominated state service uh, general ranks, accounting for eight of the 14 men who led the Indiana Le Legion or held administrative positions. The other six included two professional soldiers, a physician, a professor, a building contractor, and a merchant. Regardless of, of, of occupation, military Pardon me, Indiana generals were, were politically connected. Fully three-fourths of full rank generals held some governmental post before, during, or after the war. Many were county officials, judges, and state legislators, <coughs> and several mem were members of the U.S. Congress. About half of all brevet generals held political office, and all but three of the state service generals held political posts other than their wartime position. Patriotism in the form of a commitment to saving the Union and, the, and abolishing slavery was a prime motivation, but so also was a common awareness that defense of the nation might advance one's post-war political career. Two political full rank generals are particularly noteworthy. Ebenezer Dumont was born in Viming in Switzerland County. After education at Hanover College and Indiana, Univer Indiana University, he studied law and opened a practice in Lawrenceburg. Between 1835 and 1860, with time out for the Mexican-American War, he served as treasurer of Lawrenceburg and Dearborn County 
Speaker of the Indiana House of Representatives, Elector for Franklin Pierce, and President of the State Bank of Indiana and the State Sinking Fund Commission. Even more notable was Alvin Peter Hovey. He was born in 1821 in Mount Vernon, Indiana far western, southwest corner of the state. After studying law, he entered practice in his hometown. He volunteered for Mexican-American War and was commissioned a lieutenant, but saw no uh, action. After the war, he resumed practice in Mount Vernon. In the 1850s, he served in the Indiana Constitutional Convention, was elected a Posey County Circuit Judge, and appointed to the Indiana Supreme Court. When he was defeated for election to a full term, Pre President Franklin Pierce appointed him U.S. Attorney for Indiana. He served until 1858 when he changed his political affi affiliation to Republican and ran unsuccessfully for the U.S. House of Representatives. After outstanding wartime service, he served as U.S. Minister to Peru, was elected to Congress in 1856, and elected Indiana governor in 1888. He died in office in November 1891. Indiana's most notable politician general was Reverend Brigadier General Benjamin Harrison, grandson of former territorial governor and president uh, William Henry Harrison. Benjamin was born in 1833 in North Bend, Ohio. After graduating from Miami University in 1854, he read law, was admitted to the bar, and established a successful practice in Indianapolis. He also entered Republican politics and was elected reporter of the Indiana Supreme Court in 1860. In 1862, Governor Morton asked him to raise a regiment, and Harrison re reluctantly accepted, despite his lack of military experience. His service included reconnaissance and railroad duty in Kentucky and Tennessee, and command of a brigade during Sherman's Atlanta campaign. He re-entered politics after the war and was re-elected Supreme Court reporter. He lost a close election, uh, pardon me, a, a close gubernatorial race to James Blue Jeans Williams uh, in 1876, uh, but his leadership enabled him to fill the U.S. Senate seat opened by the death of Senator Oliver Morton. This is interesting. Harrison was defeated in 1887 uh, for re-election to the Senate, but his prominence propelled him to the presidency when he defeated uh, President Grover Cleveland in 1888. His one term uh, produced some, much major legislation, including the Sherman Antitrust Trust Act and the Meade Inspection Act. Militarily speaking, Indiana's generals were not a distinguished lot. While most served ably and, and honorably as brigade, division, and corps commanders, none succeeded at the highest levels. Major General Don Carlos Buell organized the Army of the Ohio in early 1862 and led it well at Fort Donaldson and Fort Henry and at Shiloh. But his failure to follow up after the Battle of Perrysville resulting in his loss of command. Likewise, Major General Ambrose e. Burnside performed well in division and corps commands, but he failed miserably as commander of the Army of the Potomac, ordering successful frontal assaults against entrenched Confederate troops at Fredericksburg, Virginia in December 1862. At lower levels of command, Brigadier General Malon D. Manson's uh, Indiana Brigade suffered heavy losses against Braxton Bragg's Army at Richmond, Kentucky, in October 1862. And he was captured along with 4,000 of his troops. Controversy also surrounded Major General Lewis Lou Wallace, who got lost and arrived late at the first day of Shiloh. But Law Wallace would gain fame after the war as the author of the popular novel, Ben Hur, A Tale of the Christ. The most controversial Hoosier general was Brigadier General Jefferson Columbus Davis, a Clark County native who murdered his commanding officer, Major 
General William Lowell Nelson at the Galt House Hotel in, August, in October 1862. He ultimately avoided court-martial and served out the, the war in a series of effective divisional and corps commands, but he never achieved uh, the full rank of Major General. Remarkably, in a war where generals often led from the front, only one Hoosier, uh, died, Hoosier general died in battle. That was Brigadier General Pleasant Adams Hackleman, who sustained a mortal wound while rallying his uh, brigade at Corinth, Mississippi. To this point, now I'm on the last page. Uh, <laughs> the generals I've highlighted fought with the Union. But I would remiss if I omitted the sole Confederate, Francis Asbury Shute. He was born in 1834 in Franklin County, uh, <clears throat> graduated from West Point in 1855, and served with the artillery in Florida during the Third Seminole War. After five years of service, he returned to Indiana, studied law, and opened a practice in Indianapolis. He also joined the local militia company. But Shoup apparently admired the South's aristocratic culture. And in 1861, he returned to Florida and established a practice in St. August, Augustine. When the Civil War began, he offered his services to the Confederacy and served in a succession of positions, mostly in uh, artillery. In closing, the Civil War Generals of Indiana does not pretend to be the final authority on Hoosier generals in the Civil War. I have attempted to be as comprehensive as possible in identifying those who wore general stars, but the sketches are necessarily brief. Many subjects, especially brevet generals, lived in relative obscurity before and after the conflict, and document, documentation about them is thin. Nevertheless, I hope this work will inspire other historians to dig more deeply into the lives and tell the little-known stories of Indiana generals, as well as their comrades from other states who answered the call to save the Union and end in the nation's original sin of slavery. Take a couple of questions if uh, Steve permits. Any questions, John? Carl, this is fascinating. As, as you said at the end, has any other state done what you have done? Not that I'm aware of. Uh, I, Every I, state should do it. I think it's a fantastic way to look at Civil War history. I think so too. And I, I hope uh, th this book was published by History Press, and I'm sure many of you are familiar with it. The same press uh, that published the German books that we worked on with uh, uh, Bob and Vicki uh, on Rankin, had numerous uh, contributors to. I hope others who uh, are familiar with the History Press might see that as uh, an opportunity. And I'm sure if there have been others, uh, I would uh, check out for uh, further information uh, about some of the generals who I talk, uh, talk about here who would also been in their states. If anyone needs to leave, feel free to do so, okay? And while we can't do the questions. Yes, you talk a lot about them not being real successful as a group. And I guess that means they didn't win a lot of battles, is that? Well, is they, that did, uh, they did They uh, did gain much fame, and those who gained fame uh, didn't gain it necessarily for their uh, uh, high level of, uh, of performance. Is that contributed because most of them were their political association and they weren't real soldiers? Not necessarily. You, you take uh, uh, Buell was a West Pointer, uh, and I, I think part of uh, that uh, lies in the, in the fact that different officers had different skills. Buell, for example, was excellent in organizing troops. He wasn't very good, it turned out, at leading troops uh, in, in, the, in the field. But there's another uh, significant person in World War II who had the same, uh, a very similar situation. His name was George C. Marshall. He was great at staff work, overseeing, planning, but 
it was well known that he was not uh, very good at leading troops in the, in the field. So, but, but they wanted him to move up. So what did they do? They gave him command of uh, the, uh, I think it's the, the 3rd Regiment out of Fort Myer, which was such a crack unit, they figured uh, uh, get him in, get him the, the minimum time to get him out, and that he couldn't screw it up uh, in that length of time. But he had to, uh, field, had to do field command before he could move back into a stack. Maybe just one more question, one more question before we need to head out. Any other questions? Well, thank you. Well, you've got everything there in the book, and so we thank you very much. And I'll be glad to sell you.